Welcome back to the Warehouse Podcast, part of the Believe Podcast Network. My name is Tyler, and today I want to talk about the Baltimore Orioles. What else? Um, but I want to talk about one specific part of the Orioles roster, how it's changed throughout the season. And the reason I'm a little bit concerned about it as the postseason gets closer, although maybe maybe I shouldn't be. Um, before we get into that, I do want to give a shout out to our podcast sponsor for this episode, and that is Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. That's right. While we're still concerned about baseball here on the Warehouse Podcast, the football season, we cannot deny it is coming up. As I record this, we are one day away from the start of the NFL season with the Baltimore Ravens, you know, kicking off the season. Not everybody that is an Orioles fan is a Ravens fan, but if you're into that, Bet Online might be able to help you out because Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. Think you know your stuff? You can get in our $200,000 mega contest and pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of $200,000. And when the game's over, head on over to their online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of over 150 slots games. So head to the website today, that's betonline.ag, to get in on the action and check out Bet Online. The game starts here. All right, so... What is the part of the roster that I am most concerned about? It might seem rather trivial, and it probably is for the the regular season, but I think it does matter in the postseason. It's going to be that reserve infielder role that the Orioles have, you know, maximized more and more as the season has gone on. And I think now where we are in the season where you have first base kind of sorted out, you know, it's Ryan Mountcastle's hurt right now, but in general, it's O'Hearn and Mountcastle. We know we've had Emmanuel Riviera or Rivera rather come in and play some first base. Second base, I think, is Jackson Holiday's job right now. Shortstop is obviously Gunnar Henderson. And then at third base, when he's healthy, Jordan Westbrook is going to be the third baseman. Hopefully that happens before the end of the season. For now, Kobe Mayo is playing there a little bit with Ramon Urias on the IL, unfortunately. And Rivera is playing over at first base a little or at third base a little bit as well. But in the perfect scenario where you have kind of established starters at all those positions, which I think when healthy, the Orioles have that. That allows you to have sort of a rover backup infielder that can play various spots and also serve in different capacities, specifically pinch running, defensive replacements, things of that nature. And the Orioles in the organization have that in Jorge Mateo, right? Mateo has been the starter for the Orioles in previous seasons at second base, shortstop, this season, he is more clearly, I think, faded to a back backup role. Obviously, played second base um, in between Jackson Holiday's stints, where he really struggled in April, was gone for much much of the summer, and then just came back um, at the end of July. In between that, second base was mostly Jorge Mateos, but it always sort of felt like the inevitable, you know, fate for him was going to be backup super utility guy that can spot start here and there, and then make an impact in some way on the game uh with his legs or his glove or something or other obviously that's not an option for the Orioles because back in late July he suffered that very tough looking injury in Miami where he collided with Gunnar Henderson on a ball up the middle that had gotten deflected uh both of them kind of went after it Mateo's arm kind of got caught by Henderson and bent in a weird way that ultimately has been determined he needs elbow surgery I think for a while people were saying, oh, he'll be back, um, you know, before the end of the season, he could still make an impact. We now know that's not going to happen. He's undergone elbow surgery and he's shut down for the rest of 2024. You know, and I think the outlook for Mateo is a little cloudy for the Orioles. I think he's got one more year of team control and, you know, going to go through arbitration and, and all that stuff. So we'll see what happens there, but it, it doesn't really have too much of a bearing on the 2024 season, obviously, except that. The Orioles now don't have that obvious backup infielder solution coming. That you know, it's it's September, trade deadline's well and truly passed. That's been a month since, and then August is sort of that month you can kind of find, get those final bits to add to your roster to hope that maybe, you know, this can be the little sprinkle on top that that helps you get over the top. Those are those options are all gone, and also if I understand the rule properly players have to be on your 40 man roster by the start of September to be eligible for the postseason roster. And so it's not like there's a guy down in 
double A, which, you know, I think I've, I've theorized about with Enrique Bradfield as a guy you could, if you're really like break class, break glass in case of emergency situation, you could put Bradfield up to the 40 man just as, you know, maybe if we need him, all of that, you know, then he's on the 40 man and, and that, uh, you know, kind of handcuffs you a little bit with roster moves in the off season. When you have a player on the 40 man that you don't probably expect to be on the big league roster, at least to start next year, it's, it's not optimal roster manipulation there. That can't happen anymore at this point either. I don't believe because he's not on the 40 man roster. So what the Orioles have on the 40 man is what they have at their disposal for the postseason. Obviously there's guys injured in Urias Westberg um, that can come back and hopefully will come back and will make the postseason roster. But again, none of those guys factored in this conversation. Urias maybe factors in, in terms of a backup infielder, but certainly not a guy that's going to make a big impact on the game with his legs as Mateo could. So let's talk about Mateo for a second, because he's a guy that's gotten a lot of grief historically, I think from Orioles fans, when he first got here, he was really exciting on some bad teams. Then he had that really good first full season where he was, it should have been gold glove winner at shortstop ultimately wasn't, but I think we in Baltimore really appreciated him for what he could do. And then he's sort of, his luster is sort of worn off as he's been exposed a little bit more, especially offensively. It's just not, he's not great in the batter's box, but he, he certainly has his moments against left-handed pitching, which is another um, thing we're missing out on without Mateo. But specifically, I want to talk about um, his base running because it just is fantastic. And I'm not even talking about just stealing bases. He's, he's quite good at that. But the other element of his game related to that is just taking that extra base whenever and however he, he can. So if you look at baseball savant, you can go to like their leaderboards for base running. And Mateo is still 18th in all of baseball in what they call runner runs. So these are runs earned attributed to your base running ability. And most of this is related to um, how often you take that extra base. It's not necessarily stolen bases. And an interesting thing you can do is look at um the percent percentage of advanced opportunities, the attempt percentage of those advanced opportunities, so that the chances to take extra bases and how often that player takes those chances. So Mateo takes those chances 50% of the time, which is one of the higher um, ratings in here. I'm looking through just eyeballing it. And the only guys I'm seeing better than him are Corbin Carroll, uh, Bobby Witt Jr., Kyle Isabel, Isabel on the on the Royals. And then Byron Buxton is tied with him. So I think apart from Isbell, which maybe I'm just ignorant there. I don't know that you think about Isbell as like a premier base runner. He 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 may be. That may be a well-established fact. But you definitely, people think about Corbin Carroll and Bobby Wood Jr. and Byron Buxton, I think, as exemplary base runners. And Mateo is right there with those guys. His runner runs are down at two instead of up at five or seven, where uh, Bobby Wood Jr. and Corbin Carroll's are simply because the playing time. I mean, obviously, Bobby Wood Jr. is on base a lot more, so he's got more opportunities and he's a better, you know, clearly a better player overall than Jorge Mateo. But so less playing time, plus, you know, in addition to not being an every single day player, Mateo, he has been hurt for over a month at this point. I think if he's healthy and plays more often, you know, you could see him have double or even triple what his runner runs are. But the fact being that he makes an advance attempt 50% of the time and his that's that's a 16% increase over what like baseball savant thinks of, of normal player would do. So they think Mateo on the chances he's had 34% of those attempts is what like an average player would do. But Mateo has taken 50% of those chances. So that's 16% above the average there. Uh, the only player above him is Corbin Carroll at 19% above average. And then the other thing is on those advances, how often is Mateo safe? And Mateo has been safe on 23 of 23 advance attempts. So it's 100%. Now, a few players have 100% on their advance attempts, uh, including Corbin Carroll, who, you know, fantastic, as we've said. But not all of these players have taken as many chances as Mateo has, which is to say they've maybe taken safer opportunities where maybe it was 50-50, maybe 60-40 they'd make it, and, and they got there versus Mateo taking some chances that maybe are even below 50-50, and he gets there anyway. Now, that is some of because he's very fast. That is some of because he is scouting 
you know, maybe in a way that these outfielders or whoever he's running on to say, I don't think that guy can get me. So I'm going to take this base now. And some of it obviously is fielder errors and, and poor attempts. I think a good example is like, if you go to baseball savant and you can click the little camera icon next to Mateo's row of the, of the uh, base running leaderboard, it brings you all of those attempts. And then next to it, a video camera icon that you can click on and watch every one of his attempts. And it also gives you a column of runner runs attributed to that individual play. And the very top one is from May 27th against the Red Sox. And I looked at this before I started recording and he does end up safe and he gets attributed a quarter of a run for this attempt. Um, and he was running on uh, Rafaela from the Red Sox on a shallow ball in center field that even the fastest guys, I don't think you would think would run on it because it was just not a very difficult throw for a professional baseball player. Uh, Rafaela makes a bad throw home. Mateo's safe. He, he goes in, I think, sliding, but probably didn't have to because the throw was just offline. But a good throw maybe nails him. So that's kind of an example of a mix of things here. But again, he forced the issue because his speed and his aggressiveness, and still it's fair to attribute that to him, just kind of you know giving the context there. But I think the fact that he's with all these guys you know, in the same conversation as these guys who have played all season long. Most of them are every single day players. Mateo's not that he's been out for a month and he, he, you know, wasn't playing every single day is really pretty remarkable and sort of, you know, draws the picture of how good a base runner Jorge Mateo is. The Orioles now don't have that. And if you, you know, you look down this list of top base runners, the next one down for the Orioles is Gunnar Henderson at, at 31st. Mateo was 18th. Henderson's down at 31st. Um, Colton Kowser's down there at 45. I would expect Cedric Mullins to be on here somewhere, but that could be Jordan Westbrook's at 76. So there, that's another a boost to the base running eventually. Um, O'Hearn at 111. So maybe I missed no Mullins is 126. So you see there's a drop off there and each of these guys, none of them are sort of fitting that, that same mold of Mateo in terms of not an everyday player, so he's available off the bench for Brandon Hyde at most moments of the game. Henderson's playing every day. Um, Westbrook's playing every day when he's healthy. Mullins is not playing every day, so that's something we could talk about. O'Hearn is playing every day, and O'Hearn, is, well, if not every day, most days because he faces righties. And if he's not, you're not going to put O'Hearn in to run the bases. You're going to put him in to face a right-handed relief pitcher um, if the opportunity strikes. So, you know, kind of, kind of just explaining my case there a little bit. Um, and what I also wanted to do was to show how much he matters to the Orioles is to take a look at team stats since he's been injured. So Mateo got hurt on the 23rd of July down to Miami. So since the 24th of July through today, I'm recording on September 4th. So through games on September 3rd, uh, if you look at base running value on fan graphs, the Orioles have a negative 2.3 base running value, which is 23rd in MLB. The teams below them are not all bad. It's the White Sox, the Rangers, the Mets, the Angels, the Astros who are good, the Braves who are good, and then the Blue Jays who are not good. So in general, not very good teams. The Twins also have negative 2.3. So again, the Twins are a pretty good team. So again, base running, I don't think is like the direct line to winning baseball games. The top base running team in the league are the Tampa Bay Rays. The Chicago Cubs are second. So those are two teams that aren't, you know, exactly World Series uh, contenders right now. But Again, you'd like to be good at an aspect of the baseball game, not bad at an aspect of it. So the fact that the Orioles are a, you know, demonstrably bad base running team since they haven't had Jorge Mateo on the roster seems to matter to me. And then if you just want to look at, you know, maybe more of a classic base running statistic, stolen bases, they're 22nd in the league since Mateo went down with 19 stolen bases. And they've also been thrown out seven times. So 19 for 26, I think is 73%, which is sort of right on the cusp of that even being valuable. I think I haven't, you know, read the updated number on it, but I remember it being 70 to 75%. Um, stolen base success is like where going for stolen bases is worth it. Um, you're putting, you know, you're putting a guy in scoring position most of the time while well, you are, if you're stealing a base. But if you're losing a guy a third of the time or more than a, th more than a quarter of the time, um, it's not really worth it because, you know, the cost of, running into an out that you didn't have to take uh, obviously outweighs that. Um, so they're kind of right on the cusp there. So 
in terms of stealing bases, are they a good stealing base team right now? Uh, you know, they're about average and, you know, that's fine. That's survival. It's not a, a detriment. It's not a total drag on your offensive ability, but it's certainly also not catapulting you to more opportunities to score runs than you should have otherwise. Again, the Rays are tops in the league at 59 stolen bases. They've been thrown out nine times since then. And the Nationals, 53 stolen bases, and they've been thrown out 16 times. Um, the Rays, I think what is worth noting on the Rays is that, um, and, and I can look this up to be sure of it, but I believe for the, a long time the Rays had a much lower Pythagorean win outlook than what their actual wins were. So the Rays are 68 and 70. And their Pythagorean win losses is 62 and 76. So that's just to say that based on their run differential, they should be 62 and 76, but the actual outcome of their games is 68 and 70. So they're six games better than they should be. Now, stolen bases, you know, how does that factor in Pythagorean? I couldn't say exactly, but what I would say is that you are putting yourself in a play in a position to score when maybe you're not getting the sort of extra base hits you'd like. You're not getting doubles and triples and home runs, but maybe you're getting singles and then stealing a base. And that is as good as hitting a double. Essentially, you're, you know, you're not in scoring position for one or two fewer pitches, but um, you're ultimately getting to the place that you want to with that higher slugging percentage, you know, team. Um, again, that should lead to more runs, but it's also just kind of forcing the issue. And, you know, there's probably, there's probably been games the Rays get sort of blown out. And then there's probably just as many games that they've won by a run or two that maybe most teams don't don't get. So that's sort of my my thought process there. So to lay it all out, Mateo being out's a problem because now the Orioles don't have an obvious solution as that backup infielder that can kind of do everything at any point in the game. They they don't have a solution there. And it's bared out in the data that the Orioles right now are a subpar baseball or a base running team. I wouldn't say they are outright bad. Yes, it is a negative for them, but they are alongside some other decent teams. And the Orioles have still some exemplary base runners. Um, Gunnar Henderson is a very good base runner. Colton Kowser, you know, I would say hit or miss. The numbers say he's a decent base runner. Um, I don't know that always bears out in, in what I feel like your eyes say, but the data says it. Mullins is kind of the opposite where he's ranked below um, Kowser in a lot of these, you know, uh stat cast type numbers but he steals bases and he um looks the part most of the time and and that could be some reputation stuff for Mullins obviously as a former 30 base stealer in a season I just kind of feel confident when he's on the bases and Kowser's a rookie so there's some of that at play maybe um and obviously the stolen base numbers are good to see that like that gives you like a concrete number you can be like yeah he steals bases that means he's a good base runner of course it doesn't always work out that way um but that's that's kind of where we're at there so where do the Orioles go from here and does it really matter does it really matter let's talk about that first um I don't think you have to have an obvious out and out base stealer on your roster um the Rangers last year certainly didn't win the World Series because they had a bunch of guys that could steal bases they mashed their way to a World Series win and I think that the 2024 Orioles are certainly built more in the mold of the Texas, Texas, the Texas, Texas, the Texas Rangers than any other recent world series winner. I mean, think about it, the starting pitching, if the Rangers went into the postseason with this was certainly not extraordinary. Um, You know, Jordan Montgomery is, was a very good pitcher for them, but I don't think you, you would have thought that prior to last season, he was some sort of dominant postseason pitcher. And he really, he really wasn't in the postseason, but he was good in the second half of the regular season. The bullpen was all sorts of a mess going into the postseason for the Rangers last year. That got a little bit sorted out in October. Um, Like I said, they didn't really steal a ton of bases, but they just mashed. And that's what this Orioles team can do. And I think you, you, you'd probably say that this, the 2024 Orioles have more upside than the 2023 Texas Rangers did because we have Corbin Burns, who I think historically is better than any pitcher the Rangers still had healthy at the end of last season. Um, The roster is a little bit younger than last year's Rangers team and ascending. You'd expect, you know, Gunnar Henderson's only going to get better. Adley Rutschman's had some issues here in the second half, but ultimately you probably depend on him or, you know, can count on him. Santander has been fantastic. 
So I think there maybe is a little bit more of upside there. And the Orioles certainly can hit home runs with any team in the league. They're, they're still among the league leaders there, but certainly questions about um, the, the pitching staff. But if you think about other World Series winning teams like the the Royals, I know we don't like to talk about them many years ago, but Terran score was certainly um, an impact player for them during their successful years a decade ago. Dave Roberts back in the day for the um, the Red Sox. Obviously, that's, you know, 20 years ago at this point. The baseball, the game of baseball has changed quite a bit, but that's relevant. And then even last year, you know, they didn't win the World Series, the Arizona Diamondbacks, but that's kind of how they got to where they were. They were scrappy. They could they could squeeze out runs when they needed to. They could get just enough done. And uh, they had sort of the pitching on their side to, to be able to make that happen. Um, so, you know, it's a mix of things. There's no one way to to, to skin a cat here. There's there's more than one way to win a World Series. Um, and having more tools at your disposable, disposal feels better than not to have those things. So do the Orioles need that type of a player? No, they don't necessarily need it. Could they figure somebody out to, to do that role right now? Well, let's look at their 40 man roster and see if that's at all possible. I think some people were thinking about Forrest wall as that solution. And what I will say is I'm a little unclear on, on where Forrest wall would fall here. So Forrest Wall was a player the Orioles added to the 40-man roster just before September. Then they DFA'd him just after the start of September. I believe as I'm recording this, he's still in DFA limbo. I can check that. But I would imagine they're hoping to be able to outright him and keep him in the organization. Now, because he was on the 40-man roster when it became September, even though he's not currently on the 40-man roster, can he be elevated again? and used in the postseason there's there's potential there that i i'm not sure of the rule there i could see because otherwise i'm not really sure why the orders would have added him to just dfa him when you could have added somebody else in the organization to um potentially be part of the postseason setup uh whereas wall just seemed very blatantly like we need him as like uh uh an option in october if we get there um, so, so there is that caveat there. I will throw out there, but besides that, if you look at the 40 man right now, I don't think you're going to consider any catchers as part of a, a solution at, on, on base running. Uh, Gunner's going to play every day. Jackson holiday is going to play every day. Nick Maton. Let's look up Nick Maton's, uh, base running ability. And obviously this is just me looking at numbers on a stat sheet. It's not going to tell the whole story here and he's not going to have any performance for this season anyway. Or for last year, he played with the Tigers, I think, a bunch. Um, base running, you know, sprint speed is slightly below average. Uh, let's look at running here. He had one runner run last year, so maybe Nick Maton is somewhat of an option, although certainly not an out-and-out -out, um, Mateo replacement. Uh, Kobe Mayo, you know, I think we've heard a lot of good things about Mayo doesn't seem to me to be super fleet of foot, so I don't view him as an option. Mountcastle, no, faster than you'd expect, but not not a pinch running super speedster on the bases. O'Hearn, same. Emmanuel Rivera, let's look at him real quick. Haven't gotten the feeling that he is uh, gonna blow your doors off on the bases either, but I've been wrong before, and I I will be wrong again, and I would happily be wrong. And of course, I've chosen to use savant on the on the fly and it's a little bit sluggish but yeah Rivera like we've said we've heard he's more of a fielding glove first kind of guy and his numbers are good there this season not the best numbers on the bases was a negative one runner run last year for the Diamondbacks let's keep going Levon Soto I doesn't have enough data here to really back it up, but the Orioles are keeping him around for some reason. So maybe it's his legs that are the secret weapon. I have my doubts there. Uh, he's probably got like no data. So this is probably not a useful one runner run in 2022 for the angels. Uh, sprint speed 27.5. So he's, that was in 2022. So, you know, two years ago, but that's probably about um, average for him or for the league there, 27 and a half, maybe a little bit above average, but he's a shortstop. So um, Ramon Urias, no. Jordan Westbrook, no. Westbrook going to start every day when he's healthy. Urias is not a speedster. Kowser, we already talked about that. He's playing every day too. Kerstad, no. 
Mullins, Santander, Austin Slater, Eloy Jimenez. So I think what we kind of come down to is that Mullins and Slater, they are basically in a platoon right now where Mullins starts against righties and plays center field. Slater starts against lefties and plays one of the corners, you know, if, if Santander gets a DH day, but usually left field. And, you know, what that allows the Orioles to do is have one of them free to to pinch run, you know, it, whichever one isn't starting could pinch run. Now, I think we know about Mullins. He, as we kind of just talked about, steals bases, doesn't have the highest base runner runs that you would think. But to me, feels like he's savvy on the bases. Yeah, he's accounted for zero runner runs this season. He advanced. He got two runs for advances, negative one run for being thrown out, and negative one run for holding at a time he was probably a little bit too conservative on. Um, But I think ultimately you feel pretty good about him on the bases. And then Austin Slater, let's take a look at him. Uh, To me, he's a guy that, is probably above average, yeah. 28.2 feet per second, which is 70th, 75th percentile for speed. And then if we look at his runner runs, he's accounted for zero this year. Most recently, the most recent season he accounted for any was in 2021 for the Giants when he accounted for one runner run. So I think he's he's a competent base runner. And certainly, you know, you'd you'd rather have either one of them on the bases than, you know, late in the game than Santander or, or Rutschman, I think. Um I'm not sure who else really besides them. And and that that's a potential answer as well is that most of the Orioles, a good amount of the Orioles are good base runners. Um, Gunner, good base runner. Jackson Holly for a rookie, I think is a good base runner. And he's fast. Kowser, fine. Um, when Westbrook is back, you feel good about him. And then if Mullins or Slater is, is starting, you feel good about, whichever one of them them is on the basis. So that's five guys. So it's really like you probably want to replace the catcher, whoever's catching, whoever's the first baseman and Santander, those three uh, in a late, late in the game. And then Eloy Jimenez, if he plays, I I don't really want him running because he's extremely slow. So that's like four guys that you probably want to replace. So it's, it's maybe that's part of the answer is the Orioles don't have a desperate need for it. I know the data says they've been a below average team since he's been hurt, but they've also had a lot of other injuries with Westbrook being hurt um, with uh, they've kind of had the shakeup in center field holiday, getting his feet wet at second base. Um, you know, it's, it's not been, and, and Rutschman's had his little tail off here in the second half. So, you know, it's a combination of factors there. I, I don't know that I feel great about it. I think you can probably hear the trepidation in my voice a little bit. It's not something I feel fantastic about the setup with but i would imagine given the orioles lack of movement on it they don't feel that it is a hyper need you know mateo got hurt before the deadline i would hope they could have ascertained what his injury was within that week and they ultimately determined that okay if he gets back great we have that and if not you know what we feel pretty good about what we have in house that has to be the solution they've come to because otherwise they just don't really have the guy to turn to. Because as I said earlier, that Slater and Mullins kind of trade off. You want to have the other one on the bench in the event that the opposite handed pitcher comes up at a pivotal point of the game. You probably don't want Mullins facing a high powered left-handed pitcher with, you know, runners on first and second and one out in a a one run game you'd rather have austin slater step up there and if you pinch run him and he's the guy on second base or whatever then you can't do that i'm I'm not sure that's what i think the Orioles would want to do they'd rather have slater in reserve um and and vice versa for for mullins to to step in 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 place of slater so that's probably not a solution so you know i would expect that ultimately the Orioles determined this wasn't super important and you know i'm you know i i encourage them to go with their gut but to me it just always feels like it's nice to have and it is nice to have that extra body on the roster in the postseason because you typically carry an extra uh position player anyway because you don't need all of those arms um with 
the the pitchers because the, it's it's a fewer it's a shorter series so you don't need to have the max of 13 pitchers on your roster you can probably go with 12 or even 11 you know for the shorter series and feel pretty good about it and you can have sort of that secret weapon on the bases that only comes in in the eighth inning of a one-run game and runs the bases and then you take him out for somebody else you can afford to have that in the postseason where you can't really you can't really do that in the in the regular season so that's probably where they leave it and the only caveat there is the is the walls or the forest wall situation where he was on the 40-man roster to start september and if he gets outrighted and they can hold on to him they can bring him back up at the end of september um going into october and just put him on the roster and he's your guy there um because let's look at forest wall real quick i i remember looking at this just before 28.8 uh feet per second so he's fast and then running he is at zero runner runs, but he's also really not had any opportunities. So let me let me Google him real quick to make sure I'm not uh, saying something that is not correct right now. If I go to his baseball reference, they should have. It says Orioles minors. So did he get outright? Did he make it through? Let's look at his ML, MILB. Yeah, AAA affiliate. Oh, he got outrighted. Okay, so that that's the caveat there. Forrest Wall can come back up to the Orioles in late September. There's your solution there. That's probably it. Um, should have should have looked that up before I recorded a podcast, but that's probably it. If if that's a caveat or if that's like a loophole kind of in the rule of they just have to be on the roster to start September and then they can be outrighted and we keep them in the organization, we bring them back, then Forest Wall is probably your option. So be prepared for a guy that will not play a single game in the regular season for the Orioles to be on the Orioles postseason roster. That's my bold prediction there. Um, from not reading the MLB rule book at all and not being sure that that's possible, that's my prediction for the postseason. You're going to have some reliever left off that you expected to be there, like Keegan Aiken or something won't be on the roster, but Forrest Wall will be, and everyone will be up in arms, and then he'll steal a base in the eighth inning, and and all will be forgotten. Um, because I do think, ultimately, it is a serious thing. You like to have that secret weapon that can swipe you a bag and put a guy in scoring position and put pressure on the opposing bullpen late in the game. And no, Forrest Wall is not, uh, he's not Terrence Gore. He's not Ellie De La Cruz, but he is better than having Eloy Jimenez on first base where the pitcher could take six seconds to throw the ball and Eloy Jimenez maybe would get halfway to second base in that time. So I think it's important to have a guy like that. And if it's Forrest Wall, then it's Forrest Wall. But let me know what you think in the comments or you know, reach out to the show on, on Twitter. Or email. We're at the warehouse pod on Twitter. Uh, the warehouse pod at gmail.com is our email address. So let us know if you think maybe this is all to do about nothing, or if you think no, we really need that kind of guy. And without Mateo, I'm worried about it. And um, either way, let me know what you think about my loophole prediction of Forest Wall making the postseason roster. That'd be kind of interesting, right? So leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching there, or reach out to the show as I just explained. That's all I've got to talk about. So I just want to let you, let you guys know how you can support the show. Like I said, follow us on social media at the warehouse pod on Twitter, email us the warehouse pod at gmail.com. Please subscribe to the show. If you haven't already on Apple podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you get your audio entertainment, give us a rating, a five-star review or a thumbs up or whatever sort of positive review you can give us is great. It helps us reach other Orioles fans and we would really appreciate it. Also share this show with a friend of yours, if they're an Orioles fan looking for a podcast because they just can't stand to listen to local Baltimore sports radio, believe me, I get it. Send this over to them, and we'd love for them to get involved and, and join us. I think that's all I've got. Again, thanks to our sponsor, Bet Online. Thanks to Believe for having us on their network. Over to Believe.com, B L E A V.com, to find another podcast for you know a sport you might like. Maybe if you're not a Ravens fan, that's cool. Go find a different podcast for a different NFL team that you care about over on Believe. They've got a show for just about every interest in professional sports. So head on over there. And that's all I've got. So I want to thank you all for listening. As always, my name is Tyler. This has been the Warehouse Podcast. Have a good one.